Welcome to this show. Um, I'm happy to to have uh, Samuel uh, Hubert on the show today. Uh, he's a design strategist from Good Patch, and uh, I'll let him introduce himself a bit better than me because uh, he will uh, he will explain a bit uh, probably the focus of this uh, of this uh, of this show uh, a bit better than me. And I let you first uh, introduce yourself. Tell, uh, tell us a bit about your yourself, where you're coming from, what you're doing right now, and what are your center of interest. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I was looking forward to spend this Friday late <laughs> afternoon um, <laughs> talking to you. Yeah, as you already said, my name is uh, Samuel Huber. I uh, work at Good Patch, um, and Good Patch, for the ones who don't know it. Um, is a Japanese German design company, a global design company. Um, we have studios in, in Tokyo, in Berlin, and also in Munich. Um, but we're really, as I often say, big in Japan. I think it's one of the leading design studios in the, in the Japanese market. Here in Europe, we're a bit more in the challenger position, but I actually really enjoy that position because we get to try um, a lot of new approaches, a lot of new uh, things. And yeah, that's what I'm doing as well. So I work at Good Patch as a strategy director. Um, that's one part of what I do. On the other side, I also pursue a PhD at uh, the Institute of uh, Systemic Management at the University of St. Gallen in a similar field, I would say. It's in uh, prototyping strategy. So really how we can use a more synthesis-driven approach to strategy and learn a bit from the creative industries, how to strategize and so on. Yeah, but I just mentioned, um, we like to try out things to evolve uh, the way we do design, the way we do business, the way we create value. And uh, yeah, we talked about planet-centric design a bit before. So yes. we had a really nice talk already. I was roaming <laughs> the park. I don't know where you were, but... Uh, yeah, so yeah. we had a nice talk about planet-centric design and decided to follow up on that. Yes, and to record it this time because because we 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 touch upon so many different topics that are in some way really yeah they they are related um, and yeah so in the past on the on this uh, on this channel we already discussed about you know plat planet-centric design. Uh, and there's always this comparison between, you know, human-centric design and planet-centric design, and the later, the latter is most of the case, most most of the uh, the nuts seen as the the next big thing, you know, the the what what designers should aim at. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, I think I have some I have some criticisms around. Well, at least the, how it is sold or how it is presented today as an approach, I don't feel like it's necessarily a current approach. Um, um, yeah, but but maybe you can you can tell us a bit more about what you think it is. What what is your definition of planet centric design? And and we can start from 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 there because I don't want to you know force you into a definition I probably a, a slightly biased definition of it uh, I would prefer to, to start from your from your ground uh, on the matter so yeah what 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 is for you planet centric design and, and what it brings to the design field that that for instance human centric design doesn't. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Let's start there. Um, you already mentioned um, the role human-centered design plays in it. And um, yeah, the first thing I already have to say, I don't think it's the next big thing. Mm. I think it is an important extension evolution of the human-centered design mindset, which we all know. I think mm -hmm. the human-centered design got really big in the 2000s uh, through 
approaches like design thinking, the whole IDEO story and so on. Um, of course, it was technically it was nothing new in the 2000s. It has been around since the uh, let's say 60s, 70s yes. at least. I think the first time design thinking was used as a name was in the in the late 80s. Um, but it really kind of got big in the early 2000s. And yes. um, I have been practicing human-centered design for quite a while. And I think uh, it still is a very, very powerful approach uh, that manages to solve a lot of um, issues that we had. Hmm. And I also think these approaches as they come, that's quite natural, right? So we probably had um, around uh, like in the early time of the century, of the last century, we had this more technological driven focus, the focus on technology and products, it was the industrialization and all these mm -hmm. things happened. Then probably in the, I would say, late 80s, 90s, we switched to a more business driven focus when it came to innovation, like the processes. Um, everybody tried to copy the Toyota model and so on. So <laughs> lots of stories there. Yeah. Uh, then the 2000, as I said, we had the human centered approach where we really were like oh we're missing this and i do believe now in the 20s um we should move even further and um move to a planet-centric approach and now what's really important now is this is not a product focus or a technological focus shouldn't be done anymore it's not that we don't focus on business anymore and i'm also not saying we're not focusing on the human anymore mm -hmm. um you have to imagine it as a ladder, right, or, or steps. So we're just extending, refining, maybe, uh, I like to use the word recalibrating our perspective and the things that are important. So mm -hmm. this is where planet-centric design comes in. And why this is kind of urgent is human-centered design um, has a tendency to just optimize one element of a system all the time. Yes. And that's the human. <laughs> and um, basic systems theory tells you if you optimize only one element all the time, uh, it will eventually lead to systems failure. Yeah. And yeah, I, br I bring up the metaphor of a bodybuilder quite often um, who just trains her, her biceps, right? And then she has like this super huge upper body and, and super skinny legs. And <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not healthy and it looks really silly. And uh, it, it also does not result in real strength, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we really need to have a broader approach. And planet-centric design tries to do that, kind of with this paradox of being centric on the planet, which encompasses almost everything. Right. Yeah. Maybe in 20 years we sit here and we talk space-centric design. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic centric design. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a bit. I think the the, the you know it's it's the easy approach to attack the, the 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 concept, right? It's the the name is a bit like uh, okay, planet-centric design, mm -hmm. guys. Um, well, it seems like it's not it's not. It's not new, in fact, but it's sell, it's sold as as something really new, especially by some some agencies that want to be you know that want to show that they are in the you know in the trend, uh, right? And and I think like two or uh, uh, three years ago, we had this campaign of websites with the name like Planet Centric Design or Planet Planet Design or whatever, or uh, Environment Design. Um, <clears throat> You know, you, you put environmentdesign.com. Uh, I'm sh I'm pretty sure you you end up on a w agency website that sells you some <laughs> workshops or whatever. But mm. and I, I feel like it, it, maybe this is the 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 bad piece of the probably this is the bad side of the of the of the design you know of the design field for 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 this kind of thing is that we we. Agencies are incentivized to sell, uh, you know, services, and and therefore they, they they try to market on, on some aspects, and and necessarily when something is trendy, it becomes the the new, you know, the new, catchy words and and buzz and buzzwords and stuff like that. But but my point is, um, plant centric design seems to be really really close to other approaches that are, you know, that exist for since a, a long time. Pretty long time, and and that totally fit the um, all all the criteria that you just mentioned. And I, I'm just wondering, 
what's the what's the point of calling this uh, a new? But why do we still need to talk about um, planet-centric design or even human-centric design uh, in this in this case? Uh, I, I would give um, because one of my criticism is it's not a coherent approach. But at the same time, uh, I, I I don't I don't really care if it is or not because it seems to be it seems to be you know in the middle of many things that already exist. So why, yeah? Wh how do you see this? Or uh, do you think it's a valid point? Or yeah, I I have to say I understand your point. Um... There's always that element to it. But then if I zoom out a bit mm -hmm. and really think about it, um, this argument you can bring about a lot of things. Um, yes. One thing I like to refer to, there's this beautiful, beautifully done series. I think every it's called Everything is a Remix or Life is a Remix, um, yeah. where someone actually tells real novelty, genuine novelty, it almost doesn't exist. Everything is a combination, a recombination of things, mm -hmm. a remix. And I think that is true also for approaches that we have. Um, as I mentioned, human-centered design in the 2000s, it's also an old approach. Yes. Um, but maybe it helps us a bit if we compare human-centered design and planet-centric design to maybe see the benefits also when something you call the trendy. Um, <laughs> I, I would say maybe if someone gets, uh, something gets awareness because mm. um, a lot of people knew about it. A lot of people used these tools quite successfully. But I think the big achievement that uh, happened, for example, through design thinking was this uh, democratization of the process. Um, now you can say, actually, still not everybody is a designer. And I, <laughs> I agree with that. But I think it was so powerful to um, open up this tool set, to put it on, on a map um, and not just for designers, not just for people maybe like you and me who are really interested in it and um, keep reading the books all the time, <laughs> but also for people that are actually not interested in it. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing that happens suddenly is that, um, I mean, back in the days when this design approach was not so so common yet, you always had to present and explain and you used a lot of time just to educate people. Mm -hmm. And I think these days you can step, you can go straight into a conversation and you might have different definitions. Um, you might have different levels of maturity of your design mindset, but you can like, it's actionable from the start. And so that's where I see, would say like, Yes, it has been around for a while. Also, planet-centric design, I would, I would trace it back to Papanek's work in the, in the 70s, something like that, mm -hmm. um, and his anthropological approach. But um, it doesn't really matter to me, because if, if um, planet-centric design simplifies this really complex topic in a way that it is actionable and relatable for more people than just the two of us, and I can get into conversations, um, and actually have uh, an impact on how people think because it is, it, it might be simplifying. I think it is to just call it uh, planet centric design. Mm -hmm. um, but that has really, really a lot of value to me. And, okay. Uh, that's why yeah. I also like yeah. this term. I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree with you. It's a, it's a, it's a, what is interesting with the concept is as a new way to, to as a way to reframe what we should do, you know, as humans, when we, when, when we want to do things, when we want to create new businesses or organize, uh, how we, we work with others or stuff like that, that that's true. And, and, uh, um, yeah, that I'm, I'm still, you know, mixed in between. I'm, 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 you know, I still cannot make a, a my, my mind about the, this, this, this concept, uh, if, um, I see the positive, as you as you mentioned, and I also see, you know, the usual marketing, <laughs> you know, lipstick service. So. <laughs> yes, I see the the marketing lipstick as well. Um, yeah. Uh, what I would challenge is um, if marketing per se is something negative. Um, I'm sure there is negative parts to it. Yes. 
But I also think you have to be fully aware. Everything new, everything that we try to change, it goes along with storytelling, with telling a story. And it doesn't matter if it's a new approach, a new product, um, an ideology. Like it's storytelling. That's how how us as societies move on, and that has been this way for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Yes. So if we see it in that way, that it's storytelling, and it's a it's a a way of of gathering people around to work for a common goal, mm -hmm. um, then I don't see it in a bad way. If it's just used to upsell stuff, to um, put yourself on the map, to I don't know what, then of course it's it's not um, doesn't have a positive value. Mm -hmm. um, but talking about it, engaging conversations, creating awareness per se is not a bad thing in my opinion. It's uh, storytelling. And I'm sure you agree with all the design also you do in your job. Um, the design part, I'm not going to say it's easy, but uh, you, you can design, right? There's, uh, you, you learn how to do it, you can do it, but getting these good designs across, that's a huge storytelling element there. And you can use data for it, you can use stories for it, you can use a whole range of, of ways. Yeah. Um, but storytelling will remain a really, really crucial part of getting new ideas across. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That, that's that's really crucial. Uh, I, I think what happens, but that's true for every, you know, that's true for almost everything that becomes at some points, uh, you know, uh, trendy and that we want to use it because it sounds like new. Uh, that is that it, it gets reduced to the term. It's just, it gets reduced to the terminology that the, the name we put and the label we put on the on the concept. But I that's funny that you talk about how you know how we use it in the work in the daily uh, you know situation because on my side, for instance, I try to avoid using design thinking labels or you know UX design whatever because. People has already so many predefined ideas of what it should be that some it's most of the case it's it's most of the time uh, you know hinder you in your ability to do real changes than other, uh, you know than anything else. It's, it doesn't really help to use the term as it is labeled in most you know books and courses and whatever because in the end people believe it should be used in a certain way. You could prove that it's not the case, but whatever you, you, you end, you know, in the kind of debate, a, a useless debate and in the end, no one advanced, but, but yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. The story is, is more important than the, the label. And I totally relate to that. One, one point I'm really interested in <clears throat> is that how do you, or do you make a difference between these concepts? And for instance, uh, say uh, circular design or you know systemic design or whatever. Or for you, it's a, like a big <laughs> bucket where we, we have like those tools within and whatever the term you use. Because some people do this kind of categorization. I'm not a fan of this kind of categorization, categorization, right? But but that's that happens and. That's true also that some people are tend to come from specific backgrounds that make them more specialized into, you know, one concept where the tools are really similar to what you can find in other type of concepts. Like circular economy is, you know, something that comes really from more business or management type of approach where you have things like, you know, circular design, which seems to be the same, but that not really the same and, and et cetera. So, uh, how do you approach that? Do you see these kind of differences uh, in your discussions, for instance? Or I know that you are doing a lot of presentation about this uh, subject. Yeah. So yeah, it's right in the middle. Yeah, I have a lot of discussions on the topic as well. And I mean, maybe it, it also relates to what you said, right? Um, it's, I think having a term can um, simplify things, but it can also complicate it because yeah. a term is always connected to expectations. Yeah, and if you're lucky, your understanding and the expectations match. If you're not so <laughs> lucky, they don't. Um, now, when we come to all the different types of design, um, I just had a, a, a panel discussion uh, recently where we talked about this. If there's going to be one design approach to rule them all, yeah, universal design, yes. or if there's going to be specialized ones, um, I believe most of the design approaches. 
and maybe not even the design approaches, but also um, approaches to how to organize, how to strategize and so on, how to develop things, have a core or an understanding. There is mm -hmm. process-driven approaches. Um, there is more linear approaches, but all the process-driven ones, I think, involve a certain extent of linearity. Um, especially the design approaches will involve um, synthesis or synthesizing as an important task, which kind of sets them apart from more business-driven processes, which focus on analysis. Yes. Um, yeah, so I cannot, I'm not at that point yet to define the core of all uh, design <laughs> methodologies, but I think there is this core. And then there is um, specializations within these um, approaches. And to be honest, I don't mind if there is uh, certain specializations. So I, I really um, enjoy systems thinking as well, the approach. That one is the one that is the most universal, I would say but at the same time also the most difficult to understand to get across yes. like storytelling with systems design it's so complex because they are complex mm. um, and that's why I really I personally really enjoy the the simplicity that is brought by planet-centric design which is highly systemic um, but it makes it a bit more approachable and if I then want to increase complexity I can always do that but I'm not shying away, away people and partners and the stakeholders I want to work with from the beginning by just uh, <laughs> yeah, showing them the full um, it's kind of showing them the full beauty of, of human and, and non-human life, right? <laughs> life is complex, we know that. Yeah. And actually I, I just remember from our first talk, we also talked about um, you know, maps and what is the value of a map. Yes. Right, so I was reading Latour a bit and, and uh, he actually has this concept of uh, circular reference where, where you really, if you describe something in its fullness, mm -hmm. this description loses all value because it's so, so dense, so complex. Um, it's like, yeah, if you have a, I think the example he brings is a, is a forest. If you explain the forest as it is in real life, you just have the, the forest again. And it's, yes. there's no overview, no increased um, knowledge. So a map is really a reduction of that. Um, it reduces certain parts and through that it creates value by creating this overview. And what we have to do is kind of cycle in between these representations in order to make them better and better. And mm -hmm. I really just love this, this idea. And I see this is what we do with design approaches as well. Some are yes. more detailed, some simplify. Um, and I believe actually simplifying or I would even say black boxing sometimes certain complexity is a design practice. It's, a, it's an approach we have to take to be able to deal with certain things. Yeah, I agree. That's a really, really good point. I agree with this description of map that yeah, the map is useful only if it's actionable. And if it's actionable, if it's you know, it's reduced to a, it's reduced to a, a, a contextual meaning that helps to the action that we we see fits in this context. So maps are highly contextual anyway. That's that's, and and every artifacts we we do we tend to do in design are contextual by nature. We tend to want to overgeneralize, uh, you know. What we understand from a specific context, and that's a human tendency that we all have in in, in general. But but that that's true. Uh, on the map, I I was discussing recently with people about that, and um, the the validity of a map is really interesting concept. As um, you know, uh, as it is highly contextual, as soon as you try, as soon as you design for the context, you change it, and as you do the map becomes less and less relevant, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also other factors that we are neglecting in this type of logic is the fact that many other people are influencing the context and we don't even know about it, probably. You know, that's might be the case that we don't know all the actors in the context and they are influencing the map. So the, the, the type of objects you are representing in your map define the life lifespan of the map itself. So if you were defining a behavior and that's the context is highly, uh, you know, subject to high uh, volatility, for instance, then <laughs> the map becomes useless as soon as you just made it, you know? Yeah. So 
that's uh, that's really interesting and and the fact is that as designers we tend to think that we we tend to to go in the direction of modeling we, we try to think that what we do is a good model of the reality good enough model of the reality and we tend to you know extrapolate uh felton's you know we, we tend to extrapolate some certain conclusion from the model but the model is not the reality so you know haha uh, you can you, you have surprises uh and and, and that's an interesting thing then and, and that's that's something that i feel is coming from uh some kind of the industrial era and the fact that design and engineering tend to has to have merged at some point in the past and that we see it especially in the product design and service design realm uh we see this kind of philosophy of you know modeling as a mean to change reality but as the model is not the reality we don't you still don't know if what you do in the model can be applied in reality so you have a huge gap and sometimes it just doesn't work so yeah, yeah. i agree it's not just designers i think everybody does it yes extrapolating That's... is the easy way right you have to mm. find ways how to kind of add an element of imagination i would call it or or these unexpected events <laughs> but what I find interesting when you talk about maps, about models, and maybe to steer back again, once again, to mm -hmm. planet-centric design is what I really like about planet-centric design is that it has, I mean, I defined four movements that I see that are important or four moves within planet-centric design. And the first one is from humans to planet. And what mm -hmm. that means is that we stop building models just for humans. Um, but think in these models, what are the non-human stakeholders and elements that we need to show. Hmm. And when we're really honest with most of the design tools we use, they're heavily biased towards people. User research, interviews, yeah. we, we only ask people. Um, when we do shadowing, observations, we, we follow people as they use the service. But we could, for example, once follow a shoe from being built to how it's used. Why not follow the shoe? Why do we always follow the person wearing the shoe? So I think that's what what is so fascinating about planet-centric design kind of showing us that there is this bias. I can go on. Um, user journeys, we built them for users. We say like, ah, oh, the user is happy here, sad there. What mm -hmm. if we use a user journey and we don't care so much about the emotions of the user or the person, but we actually think about what are the planetary impacts per step, positive impacts, negative impacts. It's small changes like that to our existing method um, and toolbox um, that make a huge difference. And I'm not saying you have to do everything different. That's, that's really not, not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is do smart recalibrations of the tools you have. Mm -hmm. personas um there's some great work um on the web on environmental personas or, or i call them planetary personas and yes it seems a bit weird to do a persona for the you know the atlantic or a, or a <laughs> volcano but on the other hand there is um volcanoes in new zealand or lake erie for example in the states who are um who are I forgot the english word what it is but they have a they have a personality in front of the law so they can actually sue people or, or they uh, they're not just a lake anymore but they are a, yeah they are recognized a as a pe personality yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that i find really fascinating and i could go on with with examples um of initiatives that really try to put non-human stakeholders on the map because and that's just a fact everything that does not show up in our design processes uh, will be forgotten and you can be a very environmentally conscious designer but if if all your tools just blindfold are blindfolded towards these elements um, you shouldn't be surprised if your final solution does not include it and that's this first movement of, of planet-centric design mm -hmm. that i find is so important okay okay so it raises several questions in my mind um okay two questions two questions i would try to register two questions the first is the notion of context so you mentioned that you don't want to 
Oh, I will forget the second one if I do this. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I try to remember the two. Okay, so the notion of context and the the, the second point is um, okay. I already forgot. So no, okay. Uh, so the the question is the notion of context. So you mentioned that you don't want to say to everyone to change the tools or to do drastic, you know, changes in their way of working. Just adjusting the the tools to planetary concerns and stuff like that but but <clears throat> is it tr this is true as well that uh, not every designer is working in a situation where he has or uh, her uh, she has the, the ability to influence those kind of topics and that's also true that the tools we have today are the results of you know the past you know the past uh, focus which is the business and the business is about the people who pays. So who are willing to pay for whatever solutions you create. Right. So that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the, the first point is that, uh, for you to be able to use those kind of tools, planetary tools or whatever, you need to be in a situation where you can do such, such thing. So you can be an advocate for this kind of thing, but if you don't have the ability, you won't, you would never be in a situation where you can do this. So how do you feel like? Um, how do you, yeah? How do you suggest people do more of these things that you are that you that we all want to see, mm -hmm. and at the same time being stuck by a context that doesn't provide you with the capacity of doing what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you strike a, a very important point here. Um, we should not only think about the individual, we have to think about groups, about organizations. In the end, it's a question of organizing, not of what single people do. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, yeah, I, I can't say anything against that. But what I would say, I mean, you mentioned, um, I think, I mean, it's, I, I think we can learn so much how human-centered design got big in order to make planet-centric design really the, the go-to option. Because, yeah, now you say, well, where the people are, there's the money, right? And it seems so logical. It's common sense. But to be honest, like a lot of companies still don't get this up to this very day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's yes. not that they are all human-centered. I mean, we're, we're still That's waiting true. for that. That's um, very true. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so I, I do believe, uh, yes, contexts have a huge effect, but I'm also a strong believer in practices. And practices are all the small sayings and doings we do every day. And they're, uh, they also change contexts. You know, the question is, how do you change contexts? Yeah. And it's not by complaining about the context and waiting for the context to change, but it's maybe by first starting to change your practices. Um, it's by, here we get to the storytelling part again, using simple or, or kind of concise thought models to get other people on board and work in that way mm. and then change that context. And that's this bottom up approach. But I fully agree. We need a top down approach as well. And <laughs> here, there, I think are a lot of interesting things happening. So yeah. we have in the European Union, the, the green, the new green deal from yes. Ursula von der Leyen. We have connected to that an initiative with um, the Neue Bauhaus. Uh, so a lot of really interesting initiatives and, and politics can set a lot of important triggers uh, that can make it easier for companies to go there. Um, I'm not an expert on regulation yet. I'm just kind of getting into the topic a bit, but I, I strongly believe more and more um, requirements will be released by governments around the mm -hmm. world on reporting on sustainability, on goals they have to achieve. Um, another thing that is great to relate to, and that has been established for a while now, are the SDGs, the Sustainable Development yes. Goals. Yes. Um, so that's the other um, area we can come from. Yes. And yeah, you have to kind of you have to come from these both sides in order to really change something. Is it easy? No, not at all. It's really <laughs> a lot of work, um, especially because, you know, the humans back then, you they, it's quite easy how they are connected to business, right? And yes. they're also quite vocal if you ask them. Now, when you suddenly start using uh, planetary stakeholders or you want to maybe have your neighborhood show up or um, 
Yeah, maybe I have to clarify, like planetary stakeholders for me are not just trees and volcanoes and birds, <laughs> but, but also social constructs and, and yes. systems like uh, water or neighborhoods. But it's much more work to give voice to them. Um, and it's not so easy to understand. So we have to do a, like a lot mm -hmm. of translational work as designers and not just as designers, but everyone involved in such projects. Yeah. But I think, um, I think we will manage uh, to do that. And, that we, and we have to at a certain point, we really have to get this into our processes. Yes, I, I so, yeah, I so agree with you. And that's funny because I, I see more and more uh, connection Uh, I mean, obvious and more intentful, uh, intentional, sorry, um, connection between policymaking and design. Uh, that sounds like uh, obvious, but, but, uh, for, for many years, uh, you know, policy, policy making is something like really old fashioned, old school way of doing policies. And, and now, I, I I read I read a lot of things about it and that's funny because it's some it's somewhat really recent for them to to start to use like just human centric methods for policy making and at the same time that this new type of approaches arrive they are doing more and more systemic design uh, you know approaches for policy making and that's really interesting in how fast this uh, this world is is moving. Uh, that that's really interesting, but I totally agree with you. It's it's um, the politics and and incentives has to come with uh, to help for for this kind of uh, for this kind of approaches. Had uh, that's that's what you said about translating, uh, you know, the stakeholders that that do not have a, a, a voice for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, and that's raised some questions around ethics and interpretation. Uh, that's I'm really worried about the fact that as designers we tend to see ourselves as the experts of translating the you know the voices. Uh, that's one recurrent narrative in our field, and that makes us feel like we are legitimate in doing so. But I I don't feel that it's really often the case, and I'm really interested recently into narrative research uh, and uh, which is a case where you don't translate for people you let people translate what they mean what they mean directly and so you get stories and you don't touch them you don't touch the, t the stories uh, and you use this as um, as an engine for you know sense making mm -hmm. and therefore this is the translating parts that is done by the community Is that you? You the translation part? Sorry, is done by the community, and and then anyone can interpret the data as it is really uh, meant by the the people who wrote it. You know, mm -hmm. and I really find this interesting. It's, it's a lot of work to do, but it's way more. You know, you remove one aspect of the of the of the of the approach that is questionable really questionable and the more we go in the future the more we see like the intervention of algorithm to interpret data which questions a, a bit more the the approach because you know algorithms are not you know uh they are not they are not unbiased they are yeah, yeah no I, i fully agree i mean i i'm not like i'm not working so much on that on my work with Goodpatch, but when it comes to the PhD, I do a qualitative research project. Mm -hmm. And that's the question you have all the time, right? When am I interpreting too much? When am I translating too much? And so yeah. on. Now, when you're with humans, then it's really, you could have them talk for themselves. <laughs> I <was there. laughs> I'm forward. looking forward for you to show me the narrative <laughs> of a tree, but um, <laughs> be the rings, right? But yes, no, I absolutely see your point. But I learned something very important from my professor who's supervising my uh, PhD. And he said, there's, there's no view from nowhere. That's an idea that just does not exist. It just doesn't. Yeah, that's the point of objectivity. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And, um, How I'm finding my way in this topic more and more is just being very clear about this awareness that everything is subjective, um, mm -hmm. that I, I literally cannot eliminate this. Um, but I use really then ways of, of zooming in, zooming out, of uh, referencing different, different ways. And 
um, then I think you can get a very you can get better at translating. I'm saying it that way. I'm fully with you um, to yep. say that you can translate and know that uh, that's a bit too much to to say. But I think you can be quite um, concise about how you how you yes. approach this translation. Yeah, I agree. That yeah, I was not me. Yeah, I was not. Uh, I fully agree with you. The the point of the the question of objectivity is is a real question and we feel like we are objective that's a human trait but 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 the point is as uh, if we agree we all agree that everything is subjective the question is how you mitigate you know uh, the possibility of the of the filtering of information from one single perspective uh, and the, the well the obvious risk you know reply to this to this question is uh get the more perspective as possible about the topic and then <laughs> you will have a better sense of what the topic is uh the point with narrative research is for instance for the tree as a tree cannot talk by its you know on itself uh you can make people that live around this tree or you know the community around this this you know this forest or whatever mm -hmm. talk for the forest uh because even though some people will just don't care about the forest uh on average you will get you know you will get uh, as you know the, the data you need to understand better the forest from a human perspective then you can get of course other criteria that comes in in in, in play but then you have you have a list of things that mitigates in the end uh, what your interpretation of what is the forest and what you should do for the forest or you know whatever I yeah. feel like it's really interesting to, to to see it this way, but again, it's a lot of work, and I'm not sure that today there's so many designers, in general. I mean, so many designers that are you know uh, well trained on those type of work. Except if you come from an anthropo anthropology you know background, maybe where this is kind of the the default method to 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 gather data around communities and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had another point because at some point you said like final solution and and I'm just I don't want to nitpick and and this term specifically, but I was interesting because this was interesting uh, as a, a way to frame the fact that even in planetary you know planet centric design you have a final solution um, uh, is the, the the question of where you know this, this concept of of a solution to a problem is so rooted in you know in the industrial era and uh, the fact that we we want to analyze the problem and we want to find a solution to it uh and and you already mentioned that i'm sure this is not what you meant but the fact is that still people can approach planet-centric design and think that there is a good solution one single good solution to the to the you know climate issue or whatever mm. and you see it in the narrative right now in the you know in the public uh places you hear like we all this technology will solve plants uh, cli uh, climate change or this thing will solve it and you, you we we are you know we want to hear something fix it something can fix it you know we want to hear that how do you how do you approach it because you know i'm sure for cl from clients that's that's you know always the case that they arrive and they have one predefined idea of what should be done or whatever and you 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 just demolishing their you know uh, yeah, as some, uh, cold, right? yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean yeah you got me there I <laughs> probably said solution but I, I usually like to say answers because yes. I'm fully with you I don't believe in the final solution I think we... yeah I was sure that it was just a, a way of saying and not your your opinion on the matter um, sure but this this uh, thing you bring up like yeah everybody is still still wants a solution yeah and one of the first things I say when it comes to planet centric design is not a solution it's an approach it's a methodology planet centric design is not the solution mm -hmm. it can lead to answers um but it, it's not gonna it's really not it doesn't have like any value as a solution it's an approach it's about yeah. the practice the perspective the process you follow um and yeah tell um <laughs> trying to tell these clients and partners 
<laughs> I mean, uh, it's loosely connected to this, but we were really reworking our design process at Good Patch, and I would have loved to just have an endless circle, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes. It's difficult when you show up and you start the project and they yes. get you to solve a problem and you're like, yeah, well, with us, you're in this eternal Loop. cycle. Yes. Yes, um, I see. I see what you mean. You know, it's it's really funny because I really see, you, you have this, you know, beautiful idea of what should be, you know, the approach, and then you have reality that hits you in the face. Like the client has a budget, he has a scope, and a, a, you know, a time, a time frame for doing this, and yeah. and therefore it's, you know, necessarily define the the type of actions you can do. Yeah, but that, maybe what I can add or. How I see it these days, I, I mentioned I call it answers these days. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is that life is a process; it's basically constant and flux. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not going to go much in, in detail in that, but I'm really thinking about what is even real at the moment and uh, <laughs> what is material. But let's put that to the side and, and just say like life is a constant process. Um, and there's one way of trying to treat it as a process all the time, but then it gets very difficult to just describe one thing because technically it's already gone. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. I and that I really learned from design and also from the synthesis approach. I believe you need sometimes to synthesize process to have a position, to have um, a settlement of your current understanding and that, and that's so, so crucial. That position will create resonance again with your context and help you to evolve further. So um, it's this movement also of the diverge and converge, but you need to sometimes um, crystallize uh, certain aspects in order to learn more. If you mm -hmm. don't do that, if you keep everything in flux all the time, you're never going to get the friction that you need to actually learn more. So, and I think that's that's important and I like the word of crystallize um, <laughs> because it's so fragile, right? It's yes. not like fixed, but it's it's really just crystallizing and it can liquidify any moment again. Um, <clears throat> but it is important because if we if we don't crystallize, the first thing that doesn't work is that it, it's very difficult to talk with other people about something that is not fixed. In yes. my mind, a lot of things are not are there, and I think like it's really great thoughts. It's so clear, <laughs> and uh, only when I really have to write them down or explain them, I kind of fix them for the moment, and I realize, okay, Sam, that's, that's actually not so smart. It's kind of <laughs> you're not quite there yet, or I realize, okay, I can really make an argument. Yes, there. yes. So, crystallization is absolute key for collectivization uh, in the end. Um, you agree. Yeah, I really agree with that. I feel like writing is a good way to, to come to this crystallization. Um, visualization is another way. Uh, what? Yeah. But then then the, the risk is always that people stick to the idea and, and just love the idea, whatever the case, it, even if, if it doesn't work. And this is where you, this is critical, what you said. It's a feedback mechanism where you have to learn from the confrontation between your crystallization and the reality and th th this should you know yeah, and you have to be strong enough to let this resonance yes. destroy the words you've written the thing you've built and other people are not but i i just think that's something you train you learn yes yes that's and true that's that's brutal i mean how <laughs> i'm shedding it uh, one or two tears sometimes right so i wrote <laughs> this all these all these pages and then i realized no, it's not it <laughs> Um, and I, it was crystallized and I just have to liquidify it again yeah. and start again. And uh, and that's just a very important thing to understand. Um, and, yeah, yeah I, I, so I have just a last question and then we I think we'll end on this point on this question. So I'm sure that people that are listening to, to, the, to the show right now say, OK, they are just talking about a lot of interesting stuff. But uh, what is it in practice doing? planetary design or whatever. Uh, so I don't know if you have the ability to talk about maybe one example or one case where you applied it and you feel like it's it's interesting because we learned, you know, it, it works well, but also we learned this, you know, uh, something like that. I can't uh, say any names yet. Um, okay. I can maybe explain it um, a bit. Yeah, around it. But um, we've used it in a couple of projects uh, now already. We, 
also explicitly, I would say we've used it for um, quite a while, but now we really try to explicitly use these methodologies and see what we can do. And for mm -hmm. example, we worked with an uh, investment startup and having this planetary perspective, when you think about how do you present the investment choices, um, made a huge difference for the team. Um, mm -hmm. On one hand, who do we present investment choices to? Um, like, is it just the investment bros, as I would call them now? Or is it like, do we really try to make this more inclusive and also um, empower other people to do it? Um, secondly, how do people invest? And that's also really important for planet-centric design. You don't just think about the app or the product itself, but really also what are the effects of the behaviors later on? Um, so that was really important. And the third one, we also started considering a lot the, the families, the people around uh, the users of, of such a product. For example, um, thinking about how are they feeling, right? Do we want them to check the stock price all the time? How can we prevent them from being like extremely stressed when, when it goes down mm -hmm. and so on? And that... Yeah, it's a, of course, it has a lot of human elements in there, but we added really also this other layer and could come up with a, with a concept that, that worked really well as, mm -hmm. a, as a total. Yeah, it's um, like, it's called, I think what you are just mentioning is called the first and second order consequences or something like that, yeah, right? It's exactly. a model where you can map mm -hmm. out the, the consequences of, your, of one decision, uh, trying to guess the probabilities of the next exactly. yeah. and, chain and of action. Yeah. I kind of, I was researching a lot also ways to kind of forecast the the emissions, right? So we're really good at uh, doing financial forecasts and uh, presenting an uh, ROI. Um, but whenever I ask people to forecast the actual impact, um, they go like, I don't know, we do that only for the past, you know, your past CO2 equivalents you, you had. And I was like... Yeah. We, we need uh, to be able to forecast this impact as well, because I want to have this together when I make the decisions, which directions we go to. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe to yeah, sum it up, like really planet centric design in action, in practice, how we use it. I already quickly mentioned the first movement, which is from from humans to planet. There is uh, three others. Uh, one is from quantity to quality. So that's really this understanding of a cake doesn't even, doesn't have to get bigger all the time. You can also make it tastier at the same size. <laughs> so, and that's really interesting from a design perspective, right? You you don't increase the number of relations. You try to improve, deepen, or thicken the the experience within one relation. Just as an example, yeah. um, the third one uh, would be from short to long term. That's another thing we try to use. There's multiple tools we use, uh, my favorite tool, the vision cone that I use all the time or futures cone as it's called, but yes, kind of finding ways <laughs> to design maybe at different temporalities at the same time. Because mm -hmm. of course, if we have to do planet centric design for a product that is shipped in two months, we're, <laughs> we're quite limited, right? But we <laughs> can have an ambition where we go to find a desirable future. Yeah. for not just the company not just the users but also the planet and then kind of come up with with a sequence of steps or iterations how we can okay. get there um so that's the third movement and the last one and that's really important if we want to make this a success it's uh, moving from a market fit towards planet fit and that kind of includes what i mentioned before or you also mentioned these consequences but i think it's pricing in externalities um, mm -hmm. really having the true price of things. Um, and there, yeah, I, I really love this example. There was a like a discounter supermarket in uh, in Germany, Penny, who had a pilot shop where they had two types of prices. One was the official supermarket price and the other one was the true price. And the true price was usually higher, normally like twi double. Um, but the cheaper the product was, the higher the true price was and when you would buy organic stuff it was closer together yes and it's really interesting um to see this and it's so important that we start calculating our business models with this in mind and that's kind of the fourth movement and to me it was really important to define these four movements because you mentioned 
many minutes ago. We've been talking for way too long, but yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a lot of these uh, terms are used as umbrella terms. So they're watered mm. down. They can mean anything. And uh, planet-centric design, we have the same issue. It's used synonym to sustainable design. It's used synonym to circular design. It's, it's everything and nothing. Um, but for me, it really helped to have these these uh, movements to understand that it's really about practices and process and not so much the solution that comes out of it. Yes. And with that, I, I really do believe it's a very strong approach and I'm learning so much right now, applying it in projects, um, exchanging with other people like you. Um, I can already <laughs> say thank you. It was really a pleasure uh, to discuss and yeah. we hope we can do this soon again. <laughs> um, but it's really something that can evolve and it's a pretty nice and uh, and small community that is building around it and just exchanging what, what we learn, where it works, mm -hmm. where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The frustration when you have a very sustainable client and realizing, well, planet-centric design doesn't change much for them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all these types yeah. of things and I really enjoy that at the moment. Uh, yeah, I just was wondering uh, because you mentioned your your four months, and I will let you go on the, on this final question, but it came to my mind because there's a concept in you know uh, I think it's called reg regenerative design or something like that, uh, a concept about um, you know going from local uh, global to local. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you apply as well? Because the, a lot of things that you're you're mentioning, like having the true price. But the true mm -hmm. price is really depends on where you are on, on the planet, right? It's uh, probably not the same price to get some resources when you are like in the middle of the Amazonia <laughs> or, you yeah. know, in the United oh, States. So that's a good point. I, I haven't included that yet, but maybe that's a fifth movement we have to add. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know yet. Currently, it feels a bit too much as a solution already, but um, it might be very interesting to see this in context, the global and the, and the local. So it could mm. be a very interesting addition. But uh, yeah, I, all I can say is thanks so much for the um, the hint. And, uh, <laughs> we'll yeah, well, well you, you just it. what you mentioned really make me think about this concept, and that I really yeah find it's it's really closely related. So. Yeah, well, thank you very, very much for your time. It was a really wonderful discussion and, and we, we touch again, <laughs> we touch upon so many things. Uh, I feel like what, what the conclusion is that, you know, I, I, look, uh, of course, that's my kind of role. I like this role of being a critic of things, but at the same time, I'm not like, you know, an opponent. I'm, I'm just more like, uh, you know, this, this guy asking questions like a bit, well, that's good to have this, but hey, that's maybe that's, that's not the way it should, we should be talking about it or whatever. And and this leads to this kind of discussion. And I really love this kind of discussion because we, I just learned things today that although it was like, make it makes sense. And I feel like I, I, I knew a bit of many things. Now I have like a more a clear idea of a clearer idea of what is what we are talking about. So thank you very much for that. And yeah, I hope we, we will be able to to do another talk like this because I think there's still a lot more to, to say about this uh, approach. So yeah, next time we focus on one thing, no? but yes. uh, thank yes. you so much as well. Um, I love a good devil's advocate, right? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to hear that you learn a couple of things. I certainly also learn a lot of things. Um, and that's just why I really love a good debate. And all these approaches, there's very valid criticism towards them. There is a lot of things that are not done uh, right, but I really enjoy when you have this exchange and yeah, we talked about it. It's a process. Things are not fixed. Maybe yes. right now these four movements are crystallized, but uh, <laughs> let's let's evolve them. Let's move them further. Let's add uh, remix them. We talked about that as well and, and uh, come up with a, with a system that really helps us to tell the story why this matters. And that also um, makes it actionable for people um, of all kinds in any kinds of organizations um, <laughs> and yeah, any kinds of contexts. And that's kind of my goal. So I really want to get to a point where um, people really feel empowered to do planet centric design yeah. and create value, not just for humans, but also the planet. Okay. Well, thank you. I hope this message is, uh, I've been heard 
by the the people that is listening to the show and and now that they they want to know more about it if they not don't already and and so they can touch up on uh, they can go to your website I, I i know that you write to you write on medium so you can look at on medium for Simon hubert and uh you can also look at the good patch website uh i think there's a lot of things uh that you that you wrote about the, the topic already so that's maybe a good starter and and yeah and don't hesitate to 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 take a look at this uh at this uh content because it's really great thank you very much Thanks so much and have a nice weekend. <laughs> yeah, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>